Luke chapter number five, Luke chapter number five, please uh, notice verse number one. Let's stand together, please, and give reverence and attention to the scriptures and, and just a challenge tonight from the scriptures, Luke chapter number five. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, of course, that would be Jesus to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him. They were thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And when he had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break, and they beckoned under their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. Now watch verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, Simon Peter now has been the recipient of a great blessing of the Lord. Jesus has done for them what they could not do fishing all night long. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Here is a blood-bought child of God, the recipient of a great blessing of the Lord. And when he receives that blessing, he falls down before the Lord Jesus and brings forth this great confession of sinfulness. Why? What's going on in Peter's life? What's happened? What's taken place? Let's walk through these verses and see if, if we can figure it out as we study Peter's confession. But first, let's bow our heads and our hearts together. I'd like to pray. Father, we bow before you and pray for the unction of the Holy Ghost of God. Gladly confess before all of heaven and these precious folk. Dear Lord, there's nothing of myself to be able to preach the word of God. I am wholly dependent upon thee. Afresh and anew, please empty me of myself. Fill me with thyself that I might live and move and have my being in thee. I pray the author of this Bible, the Spirit of God, would be our Bible teacher and preacher tonight. Strengthen us, fortify us, build us up, we pray. Bring forth the fruit around these altars that would most glorify you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated, please. Of all of the disciples, Simon Peter, we know quite a bit about his life, even more so than many of the other disciples. We know that it's in John chapter number 1 that Peter's own brother by the name of Andrew met the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John chapter number 1, it says that he cometh to Simon Peter and he brought him to Jesus. In John chapter number 1, we have Peter's conversion. In Matthew chapter number 16, Jesus comes to Caesarea Philippi and asks his disciples and say, Whom do men say that I am? They responded and said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. My, what a testimony of John the Baptist. And they thought Jesus and John the Baptist were the same. Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Jeremiah, some Elias. Jesus said, But whom say ye that I am? It was Simon Peter that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so we find in John 1, we have Peter's conversion. In Matthew 16, we have Peter's confession of the Savior. Then we know that in John 21, Peter says, I go a fishing. And he went fishing and several of the other disciples went fishing with him. And of course, this was after Peter had denied the Lord, after the resurrection of the Savior. And Jesus shows up on shore while Peter and the other disciples are fishing. And so finally they come to shore. And you know that it's in that passage of Scripture that Jesus says unto Peter, Lovest thou me? And we know that Jesus asked him three times. There's some Bible students that say that Jesus asked him three times because Peter denied him three times. But if you look at that passage of Scripture, you will find that Jesus asked Simon Peter the first time, lovest thou me, differently than he did the second and the third time. The first time Jesus said, lovest thou me more than these. I wonder who the these are. Maybe he was referring to uh, uh, the other church members that were there that Jesus had organized the first church out of. Peter, do you love me more than your church family? Thank God for a church family. Thank God for people that love us and pray for us and rejoice with us and, and weep with us. 
But my friend, we need to supremely love the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and not just the church. Lovest thou me more than these? Maybe he was talking about his church family. Not only that, but he had personal family members that were with him that was fishing. Peter, do you love me more than your family? Thank God for the family. God instituted the family. But my dear friend, sometimes people let family get in the way of their love and their service and their living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Maybe he was referring to his church family. Maybe he was referring to his relatives. But wait a minute. They just got done fishing. And Peter previously had been a commercial fisherman. Maybe Jesus was referring to the nets. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Do you love me more than these nets? Do you love me more than the opportunity to make money? Do you love me more than the opportunity uh, uh, to supply for your family? Certainly we must make money. Certainly we need to supply for our family. But Jesus made it very clear. No man can serve two masters. Amen. He'll love the one, hate the other, hold to the one, despise the other. Other, No man can serve God, uh, God and mammon, the love of money. Do you love me more than these nets? Do you love me more? And Peter responded, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. John 1, we have Peter's conversion. Matthew 16, we have Peter's confession of the Savior. John 21, Peter's confession of his supreme love for the, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, in Luke chapter number 5, we've got this confession of this great sinfulness in the life of Simon Peter, who has already been saved, a child of God. What's going on? Let's look at it. In verses 1 through 3, we simply have the present situation. Verse number 1, we have the pressing of the people. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful sight that would have been to behold. We live in a day where people press into ball stadiums. People press into gymnasiums to see a ball game. But here we find people pressing just to hear thus say of the Amen. word of God. Amen. Would to God that Nobbs Baptist Church had the problem that the building wasn't big enough for the people in the area that wanted to hear the word of God. That's what's taking place here. We have the pressing of the people. Verse number two, we have the parting of the fishermen. It says, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of him and were washing their nets. We know they've been fishing all night. They've been toiling all night. They've caught nothing. Now they're done. And so they're washing their nets. I'm not a commercial fisherman. Evidently, they've got to wash the gunk and the grime off the nets so that they don't prematurely rot and decay. I don't know. This was something, obviously, that fishermen had to do when they got done fishing. That's what's taking place in verse number 2. In verse number 3, we have the pulpit from which he preached. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Jesus used the ship as a pulpit. Jesus took an everyday situation and used it as an opportunity to put forth the Word of God. Amen. I've met some people in my life. I'm not one of them. But I've met some people in my life that are real good about taking an everyday conversation or an everyday situation and turning it around and using it as an opportunity to witness for the Savior. Just like when Jesus walked up to the woman at the well in John chapter number 4. All he did was ask for a drink of water. And that asking for a drink of water, he turned that around and used it as an opportunity to testify of himself. Here we have Jesus once again using this situation using this boat as a pulpit, if you will, to preach the Word of God. So in verses 1 through 3, we have the present situation. In verse number 4, we have the Lord's instruction. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a draught. He just simply gives Peter some instructions. And likewise, child of God, the Lord has given us instructions Amen. in the Word of God. He's given us instructions concerning our living. He's given us instructions concerning our giving. He's given us instruction concerning our service. He's given, our, given instruction concerning the sanctuary. But if I tarry long, he said, the key verse 
of the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. There is a behavior that is becoming to the house of God, and there is a behavior that is not becoming to the house of God. And the word of God explains that uh, unto us. God has given us instructions concerning manners for the master. He says, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some of God's kids got bad manners. They've been skipping out of church. Amen. Come on, y'all are here tonight. You can say amen. We're preaching about all them out yonder that's not here. Amen. And so in verse number four, the Lord just simply gives Peter some instructions just like he's given us instruction. So far, nothing unusual or outlandish going on. But now in verse number five, we find Peter's hesitation. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Peter, now we begin to see a bit of a hesitation in Peter. Peter says, Lord, after the Lord gave him instruction, the Peter says, Lord, we've tried this before. We've been doing this all night. The very thing that you told us to do, that's what we've been doing all night. It's as if, and I'm not changing the Word of God, adding to the Word of God. We learned in Sunday school this morning the absolute warning and fallacy of doing that in the Word of God. But, 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 but Peter, Peter's like, Lord, this, this isn't going to do any good. We've been doing this all night long. Jesus gives him instruction to let down the nets. And, and then and Peter, Peter, Lord, we've toiled all the night. And remember now we learned this morning that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the very fact now that Peter is hesitant, Peter is speaking unto the Lord. We've been doing this all night long as if to say it's not going to do any good. But see, Peter doesn't want to be a complete rebel. And he says, nevertheless, at thy word, We'll let down the net. We now begin to see some hesitation and Peter questioning the instructions of God. I'm sure I've mentioned it here before, whether it be in person or on video. Have you ever stopped and thought about the first time that the devil shows up in the Old Testament and the first time the devil shows up in the New Testament? The very first time the devil shows up in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter number three, he says unto Eve, yea, hath God said. <coughs> And he, put a, he puts a question on the word of God, what God told Adam in the garden. The first time that the devil shows up in the New Testament in Matthew chapter number four, Jesus being led of the spirit to be tempted of the devil uh, 40 days and 40 nights, uh, be tempted of the devil. The devil comes along and says, if thou be the son of God, he always comes with a question. Now, there's nothing the matter with asking questions as long as the motive for our question is to get information. But the devil isn't asking questions to get information. The devil is asking questions to place doubt. That's right. And so the first time he shows up in the Old Testament, he places doubt on the Word of God, on the spoken Word of God. And then the first time that he shows up in the New Testament, he places doubt on the living Word of God. And now, all of a sudden, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, we find Peter here in verse number 5, hesitant, somewhat questioning the instructions that Jesus, questioning the Word of God, because it came from Jesus uh, um, uh, concerning the instructions that he gave him. And my dear friend, uh, action is always the result of attitude. Please notice it once again. Look at verse number four. Look at the instructions. Now, when he had left speaking, he, Jesus, said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, more than one, for a draw. But look at Peter in verse number 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless at thy word, I don't want to be a complete heathen. I don't want to be a reprobate. Nevertheless at thy word, I will let down the net. Singular. That's not what Jesus told him to do. That's right. Jesus told him to let down the nets. Plural. But because Peter was hesitant, 
Because Peter was questioning the instructions of the Lord. He didn't want to be completely rebellious. And so Peter just let down one net instead of letting down all of the nets, plural, like Jesus instructed him to do. Look at the fruition of his actions in verse number 6. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Look, and the net break. If Peter would have gone all the way with God and let down all of the nets, they would have been able to keep the blessings of the Lord. But because Peter was hesitant and only let down one net, the blessings that Jesus wanted to bless him with, the net wasn't able to hold it. And now the net has broken. Now the blessings of God, the fish, are swimming obviously uh, through the broken net and the blessings that God wanted Peter to have are getting away. Now because of his hesitation and not going all the way with God, we find that when Peter gets done, he's not just going to have to wash the nets, he's also going to have to mend the nets. And it's going to require more work on Peter's part simply because he did not go all the way with God. Look at the desperation of the moment in verse number 7. And they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them. Oh, how many times have preachers heard, well, preacher, it's my life. I can do what I want with it and it doesn't affect anybody else. No, it's always going to affect somebody else. Right. Now here, Peter is going to affect other people around them that they should come and help them. Verse 7, and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. He now enlists his uh, other people that the fish are getting away. They drag the fish into the ship because Peter didn't go all the way with God, only let down one net instead of plurality of nets. Now the ships are beginning to sink. Now everything is in jeopardy, including the fish, God's blessing, as well as the lives of the fishermen, all because Peter did not fully obey the Lord. Hey, when God tells us to do something, He doesn't want us to go most of the way or part of the way. He expects us to go all of the way. Amen. But Peter didn't do it. Well, us men, you know, we, we I mentioned this morning that us men, we've got some weird quirks about us. Ladies, don't say amen right there, but we got some weird quirks about us because, you know, when we've got projects or certain things or a trip or a hobby that we like, you know, we've got to conquer it. We've got to overcome it. Well, there's another weird quirk about us men, and that is us men always got to figure out why things are the way they are. I mean, after all, you know, if something breaks down at the house, you know, the wife says, well, let's call a repairman. Oh, no, we don't need to call a repairman. I can, I can fix that. I can... I can handle that. So we get our tool belt and we dive into the thing. And by the time we get the thing tore apart, the repairman's got to fix more than the original problem. But anyway, we've always got to figure out why things are the way they are. So why is it? Why is it? Why is it that Peter partially obeyed the Lord? Why is it that Peter did not go all the way with God? And why is it that Peter brought forth this great confession of sinfulness. There's just one reason. Because Peter did not believe it would do any good. Yeah. It was a lack of faith in Peter's life. Peter did not believe the Lord when the Lord told him, let down your nets for a draught. A draught? We've been doing this all night. The Lord just told us to do the same thing that we've been doing. It isn't going to do any good. Peter's failure in going all the way with the Lord was rooted in the sin of unbelief. And my dear friend, it's the sin of unbelief that keeps a lost person lost. The Bible says in John 3, 18, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed uh, uh, in the only begotten Son of God. It's the sin of unbelief that will take any and every sinner straight to the place called hell and ultimately the lake of fire. They just really don't believe that the Bible's God's word. They just really don't believe there is a hell. They just really don't believe there's a heaven. They just really don't believe Jesus died for their sin. Maybe, maybe they don't believe. Maybe they've been so sinful that they don't believe that God could forgive someone like them. I don't know, but I know this. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps a lost person lost. That's right. yeah. 
The sin that will cause people to go into eternity away from God is simply the sin of unbelief. Peter didn't go all the way with God because of the sin of unbelief. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps lost people lost. It's the sin of unbelief that gives children of God's spirits a lockjaw. Remember when John the Baptist's father went into the temple to perform his duty in Luke chapter number one? Yeah. Remember the word of God says that he and his, his wife was barren and they could not have children? Remember the angel of the Lord appeared unto Zacharias in Luke chapter number one and, and said that you are going to have a child, you are going to have a son. And the angel explained unto Zacharias that this son, John the Baptist, was going to be the forerunner of the Lord. And Zacharias said, how shall I know these things? Oh, the angel says, you don't believe me, huh? You're going to be dumb and you're not going to be able to speak until it is accomplished. Zacharias came out of the temple from performing his duty and he could not talk. That's right. And he could not talk the whole time that his wife was expecting with John the Baptist until finally John the Baptist was born and people around were saying that we're going to name him this and we're going to name him that. And Zacharias asked for a writing table and he said, his name shall be called John. And they were all amazed because there was nobody in their family uh, that was called John. And when he did that, the Lord opened up his mouth. And the very first thing he did was begin to praise God and began to bless God. But my friend, I want you to understand it was the sin of unbelief that gave Zacharias lockjaw and caused him not to be able to speak. And oftentimes it's true with me and you. The the reason why we don't give the gospel like we ought to. The reason why we don't hand out tracts like we should. The reason why we don't witness like we should is because we just honestly don't believe it'll do any good. When all the while that Bible says in Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Listen, here it is. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. There's enough power in the gospel message of the death, Amen. burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to save any and every sinner our God is the creator and could have had every dog in our neighborhood going around barking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our God is the creator. He could have had every dirty sparrow that flies through our neighborhoods chirping the gospel of Jesus Christ. God could have done that, but he didn't. But he did commission you and I that are Amen. saved by the good grace Amen. of God to witness and to testify of what Jesus can do in the life of sinners. But oftentimes we're not the witness that we ought to be. Because we really just don't believe it'll do any good. It's the sin of unbelief that gives children of God lockjaw. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps children of God from going forward. Our brother in Sunday school today talked about, talked about the 12 spies that went into Canaan land from Kadesh Barnea. They spent 40 days in the land. They came back. Ten brought back an evil report. Two, Joshua and Caleb, brought back a good report. The ten said, there's walled cities there. The ten said, the, the ten said, Brother Hart's ancestors must come from there. There's giants in the land. <laughs> the ten said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. There's, we, we can't do this. And the two, Joshua and Caleb, said, in essence, they said, and I can show it to you in Numbers 12 and 13, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's right. We've got the word of God on this. We, we know this is the will of God. We know regardless of the circumstances, we're supposed to go forward. Amen. But anywhere from one and a half to two and a half million Jews in the wilderness... Listen to the 10 instead of the two. And they made a wrong decision. And that teaches me the majority is not always right. That's right. Amen. It was the sin of unbelief that kept Israel from going forward to Kadesh Barnea. God says, okay, all right, you're going to wander in the wilderness a year for every day the spies were in the land. A year for every day the spies were in the land 40 days. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That's where the 40 years came from. That wasn't God's plan. That was, a, that was an act of the chastening hand of God. God brought them out of Egypt that he might bring them into Canaan land. And by the way, the Lord said, this generation from 20 years old and upward is going to die and not go into Canaan land. Well, you can go to the book of Numbers and you can, the Bible gives us the amount, the number of men from 20 years old and upward. Divide that by 40 years and you get an average of just over 41 41 funerals on Monday, 41 more funerals on Tuesday, 41 more funerals on Wednesday, 41 more funerals on Thursday. Every day there was death and dying all around them for 40 years simply because they would not believe God. They looked at the circumstances instead of looking at the Savior, and it was the sin of unbelief that kept the children of God from going forward for the glory of God. 
Amen. Does not the Bible say that we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight? Amen. How many times have pastors in, in how, how many times have pastors got up? How many times have heads of households caught up? How many times have children of God felt like that God impressed their heart to do something and take a step forward? And all of a sudden they get out their calculator and they get out a piece of paper and they get out a pencil and they start adding it up how it's going to work out. And it's not going to work out. And they say, well, we can't do that. Right. No, no, we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. Sight is the calculator and the piece of paper. That's right. Faith is obeying the word of God. Faith was the children of Israel going forward and obeying the word of God in the face of bad circumstances. But because of the sin of unbelief, they failed to go forward and they wandered for 40 years and there was death and dying and stench around them every day simply because they wouldn't take that step and go forward. For the glory of God. Living by faith. Sure enough. Sure enough. It can be scary. But I'm here to tell you. God is still in heaven. Amen. God is still able. Amen. My dear friend. Do you realize that when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. Do you recognize my dear friend. And that's a real unusual passage of scripture. Because they saw Jesus walking on the water. In the book of Matthew. It's the only place that is recorded. And Peter and Jesus said, fear not, be not afraid, it is I. And Peter said, if it be thou. He wasn't sure. <laughs> and I've often wondered. He said, if it be thou, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. I've often wondered, what if it wasn't him? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, my dear friend, I'm here to tell you, nothing happened. Nothing happened until Peter stepped out of that boat. And then when he did step out of that boat, he walked on the water. And there's times in our life, come on now, this is easy preaching and hard living. There's times in our life that our God tells us to do something that goes against the circumstances, right. that goes against human reasoning. And how are we going to make it? How is this going to work out? I don't know. And you'll never find out until you take that step of faith. Amen. And then and only then when you take that step of faith will God begin to work and do something for you that maybe he hasn't done for anybody else. It's the sin of unbelief that kept Israel from going forward to Kadesh Barnea. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps the saved from obeying God. Oh, I just don't believe God will really bless me if I obey him. Yeah, I will. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps God's people from praying like we ought to pray. Mm, help us. He said, he, he said um, uh, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh find. He that knocketh shall be opened unto him. So the illustration of prayer is knocking on a door. If there was a door in downtown Tower Hill, wherever that is, if there was a door in downtown Tower Hill, Illinois, that all you had to do was knock on it, and somebody answered that door, and whatever you asked for, it got handed out that door. Are you listening to me? Even in the metropolis of Tower Hill, Illinois, there would be a line at that door 24 hours That's a day. Right. Yeah. But my dear friend, the truth of the matter is the reason why we <laughs> don't pray like we ought to pray is because we really just don't believe God will answer our prayers. Because if we really believe that we could ask him and receive what we ask for, we would have no problem getting in that prayer closet every day Asking the Lord for those things which he said we could have. It's a sin of unbelief that keeps us from praying like we ought to pray. It's a sin of unbelief that keeps us from living like we ought to live. It's a sin of unbelief that keeps us from having revival. Jonah. Jonah didn't want revival and got it. That's right. We want revival and don't have it. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is when Jonah finally got right with God. And Jonah finally went into the city and said, yet 40 days. And he talked about the judgment of God coming. And God did a work. And the people repented, even the king. And he proclaimed a fast. He even proclaimed a fast among the animals. Oh, he said, who can tell if God won't turn away his fierce wrath from us? And they sought the Lord. And Jonah became the poochy lit prophet and went out and sat under the tree. And in essence said, I'm not quoting it word for word, but in essence, he said to God, God, 
Lord, I knew you'd do this. That's I right. knew this is what you'd do. That's See, right. Jonah didn't want revival among the Ninevites because the Ninevites were a very barbaric people and Jonah was a very prejudiced man. And he did not want God to do a work among the Ninevites because he was prejudiced against them because they really were a barbaric people. Well, I got news for you. God can save barbarians too. Amen. But the difference is, Jonah said to God, I knew, I knew you'd do this. See, the reason why Jonah got revival is because he knew God would. Yeah. And the reason why we don't have revival is because we just really don't know if he will. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps us from having revival. It's the sin of unbelief that keeps us from giving the way we ought to give. God told Elijah, I want you to go. I've prepared a woman. And uh, he's down by the brook. Got them unclean birds coming, giving him a meal in the evening and a meal in the morning. So Elijah in 1 Kings 17, he only got two meals. Praise God, we get three, four, five meals. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise God. At least you know I'm on the level because the bubble's in the middle. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank the Lord, yes. But, but Elijah, he just got two meals a day from them unclean birds. And ravens came, gave it to him in the morning and in the evening. And then the brook dried up. God said, all right, it's time to move. I prepared a widow woman. Going to Zarephath. No doubt Elijah's thinking, widow woman. Maybe she's up in years. A lot of experience at cooking. <laughs> Home cooked meal. Not that he wasn't satisfied with what God had provided for him. Home cooked meal. He comes into town and finds the woman and she's gathering two sticks. <laughs> he says, uh, he, she says, uh, I, I, I. I'm gathering two sticks. Now look, I've, I've lived in some houses that had fireplaces. Are you listening? I like a fireplace. I like a fire. I think it's therapeutic, man. You put wood in that fire. And, and, and I sit there with one of those poker things, you know, those iron poker things, and rearrange the wood so it gets higher and higher and higher and higher. But I know this. You don't, you don't make a very big fire with two sticks. That's right. <laughs> and she said, I just got a little bit of oil and a handful of meal, and I'm gathering two sticks for me and my son, widow woman. I'm going to prepare it and we're going to die. And Elijah has more guts than me. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just confessing. Yeah. No sense in me pretending to be something that I'm not. Elijah says, make me a cake first. Now, come on now. If I come to a widow woman and she's, got, she's preparing her last supper for her and her son, I'm not going to say, feed me first. <laughs> but he did. He did. Yeah. Now, she's got a decision to make. Is she going to be selfish and keep that meal and that oil for her and her son? Or is she going to give it away by faith unto the servant of the Lord? And we know the rest of the story. Because she, by faith, took care of the man of God, the God of the man took care of her. Amen. Amen. It's a sin of unbelief that keeps us from giving like we ought to give. Oh, by the way, that's not the rest of the story. I've mentioned it here before, but you won't remember it. That's not the rest of the story. A little bit later on in that chapter, that son gets sick and he dies. And she carries him to Elijah, the man of God. Elijah comes, prays over that dead boy, and God raises him back to life. And by the way, those of us that study the scriptures, we're familiar with resurrections in the Bible, whether it be the Savior or other people that Jesus raised up. But do you know that in 1 Kings 17, that a lot, that widow woman's boy that was raised to new life, that's the very first resurrection in the word of God? God did for her what he's never done on the face of the earth. And it all goes back because she gave by faith and took care of the servant of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. But oftentimes we don't give like we ought to give. <laughs> Because of the sin of unbelief. I often mention, you often thought about the Bible definitions of sin. There's a lot of sins in the Bible. What about the Bible definition of sin? The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. First John says the transgression of the law is sin. First John says all unrighteousness is sin. James says he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. There's another one in the book of Romans. Whatsoever's not 
of faith is sin. Now, if you told me that you're going to come to Decatur in the morning, now don't do it, but if you're going to come to Decatur in the morning, you say, Brother Hart, I'm going to take you out for breakfast. I'm going to respond by saying, I believe that's the perfect will of God. <laughs> yeah, I believe that'd be perfect. <laughs> And so I'd say, what time are you coming by? Well, I'm going to come by and pick you up about, about 7 o'clock, all right? So I'm going to get up early. I'm going to spend time uh, in my Bible. I'm going to get dressed up, cleaned up, spiffed up, get the, get the, get the stink blowed off me uh, from preaching all day on Sunday. And you said you're coming by at 7 o'clock, so I'm going to get up. I'm going to get ready, and I'm going to wait for you to come by, or I'm going to meet you at the restaurant because you said we're having breakfast at 7 o'clock. Now, the truth of the matter is, I don't want to accuse you of being a liar, but the truth of the matter is, as a human being, it's true with you as well as with me. You may or may not show up. You may or may not show up. You said you was going to be there, but you may or may not be there. You may not have been telling the truth. I'm not accusing you of being a liar, but I'm just simply saying something might come up or whatever. And isn't it an amazing thing that the word of God says in Titus chapter one and verse number two, God that cannot lie. Whatever God says he will do, Amen. but oftentimes we are quicker to believe the creature before we are the creator. The creature may or may not be telling the truth, but the creator always Amen. tells the truth. God help us to be a people that will simply take the Lord at his word. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Hart, I know I've got saving faith. But Brother Hart, I, I'm, I'm not a great person of faith. How can I grow in my faith? You can grow in your faith, number one, by prayer. Because he said in John 17, verse number five, the apostles came to Jesus and said, Lord, increase our faith. They asked the Lord to increase our faith. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to increase your faith. Second of all, spend more time in the word of God because we know that Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. And so we find that our faith will be increased at the time that we spend in the word of God. Let me give you a prayer request. I'll, and it's not about me and my family. I want you to pray for me and my family, but I got a prayer request for you, but it's not me and my family. When you get up to read your Bible in the morning, ask the Lord, Lord, would it be okay if I read 10 extra chapters today? Just see what he said. <laughs> just, just see what he said. Yeah. Just ask him. See if he fusses at you. See if he said, oh, no, I wouldn't want you to do that. No, no. The more we spend time in the word of God, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the more our faith will be increased. We can pray about it, spend more time in the word of God, and then exercise what we have. He, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 talks about when your faith is increased. How does an athlete increase their strength? They increase their strength by exercising the amount of, of strength that they already have. How does a bodybuilder build their body? I'm a bodybuilder too. I'm just building it a different way, all right? <laughs> how does a how does a bodybuilder build their body? They put on more weight and they exercise the amount of strength that they have. And wherever you and I are, at whatever level of faith we are, if we'll step out <clears throat> by faith and exercise the level of faith that we have, then we'll find, well, God will respond to that. God will work and God will move and say, whoa, look at that. And it'll increase our faith. We can take another step of faith. And as we begin to exercise whatever level of faith we have in our Christian life now, it will increase our faith. Peter did not go all the way with God because of the sin of unbelief. God help us especially us that are saved by the good grace of God to take our master, our Lord, our God, our creator at his word Amen. and be the people of faith that he would have us to be. Let's stand please with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.